The Mustang leapt onto the scene like a spirited pony in 1964. It quickly grew from promising filly to thoroughbred racer. It lost its way for a time, but fans around the world joined arms to make sure their beloved pony car survived. It's been over 40 years since it first bolted from the stable, and it's still going strong. April of 2004 marked the 40th anniversary of the car that started the pony car revolution, the Mustang. Thousands of fans made the trek to Nashville to salute this iconic car and to meet the people who put the Mustang on the map. The event kicked off with the introduction of a lineup of Mustang heroes, like performance legend Carol Shelby, former Ford executive Don Fry, and a member of the car's original design team, Joe Horus. This is absolutely stunning and mind-boggling <laughs> to remember where it began and where it is today. The fans stormed the gates of the Nashville Super Speedway, chosen to host the 40th anniversary celebration, and poured inside to luxuriate in a world of Mustang passion. Fans could share restoration tips and take a look at some of the hottest high-performance Mustangs ever created. They lined up to meet their heroes, like performance guru Steve Saline, who was on hand to autograph posters. Seeing the amount of money spent on aftermarket performance and restoration of these once inexpensive cars was astonishing. There are more people and more money here than we did for the whole damn project to begin with. I mean, this is unbelievable. The lines snaked around the autograph booths all day, but people also clamored to get a look at the all-new 2005 Mustang. Ford hoped it would capture American hearts like the original. It even got the attention of these Australians who journeyed to Nashville for the celebration. It's an icon uh, in Australia, just as it is in America, and it's, a, it's an interest. Uh, unfortunately, we don't, we don't see too many uh, new ones in Australia, but uh, uh, the older models have uh, a great following. But it certainly looks, uh, looks good to me. Yeah. The curvy cars weren't the only shapes getting attention. Long-time high-performance tyre manufacturer Pirelli wanted to show that its tyres belonged on Mustangs as well as on Ferraris. Well, actually, it's not so unusual in the sense that uh, on the new Ford Mustang, which is coming out later this year, Pirelli has fitted his original equipment uh, for the first time. And uh, obviously, we're very happy about that to have some OE on a, on a great American sports car like the Mustang. While nearly every inch of the Mustang is new, the style and attitude forge a link to the original cars that rolled out in 1964. They were created on the heels of one of the greatest booms in American history, the 1950s. The thriving economy put cars in nearly every driveway. The money and mobility prompted an exodus from the cities to newly created suburbs. As these migrating families grew and prospered, the number of new cars on the road multiplied. This buying spree kept the auto plants humming. It vindicated the approach Ford's new chairman, Henry Ford II, had taken to turn the company around. After the war, he'd assembled a team of young whisk kids, including Robert McNamara, to rev up the company. By the 1960s, the company was really motoring. 
and Ford was poised to cash in on the youth culture presaged by the arrival of the Beatles. But McNamara, Ford's president, wasn't interested in indulging their whims. He thought Ford should build small, fuel-efficient and reliable cars. Others, like Ford General Manager Lee Iacocca, disagreed. He and product planner Don Fry were convinced that Ford had to jump on the youth bandwagon. Fry's kids were the focus group. My kids at the dinner table tell me my car sucked. They were just being teenagers learning to get their driver's license and they were representing the new era, the young people, and we had a bunch of dull cars and they said, your cars suck. As luck would have it, McNamara was lured away from Ford to become John Kennedy's new Secretary of Defense. This created an opening for Iacocca. Iacocca was finally able to create the cars he thought Ford needed. He wanted them to stand out. His first project was an attempt to make McNamara's stodgy Falcon look snazzy. A liberal dose of bright paint and chrome helped generate some interest with young people. But there was much more to do. While Iacocca was working on the Falcon, Don Fry assembled a group of engineers and designers to come up with an idea for a youth car. The team thought Ford should build something that would challenge the Corvette. The research staff said there weren't enough people who'd buy a two-seater. They'd already tried and failed with a Thunderbird. Iacocca and Fry were convinced that times had changed. They thought the right car would find all the buyers it needed. Work on what would become the Mustang One was soon underway. In a very short time, this low-slung car leapt from the sketch pad to mock-up and finally to a working prototype. This very modern-looking mid-engined two-seat sports car was clearly designed to appeal to young people. It didn't look like anything else being made in Detroit. The car and its distinctive badge, the Mustang Pony, were largely created by a 32-year-old designer, Phil Clark, who was dying. Clark felt that the Mustang design was going to be his legacy. My dad was dying uh, from urological disorders from the time that he was very young, and he wanted to leave a legacy in the name of Clark. Uh, I believe he's done that in this car and with the running horse emblem. Uh, I hope that people will remember Phil Clark and associate him with this car. Uh, he just wanted to leave his name behind. He wanted to leave some type of immortality for America. Clark's daughter, Holly, never met her dad and had only heard about the car he designed. It wasn't until the Nashville celebrations that she finally saw his creation. This is amazing to me. I never thought I'd see this car. It's amazing to be a part of this. As Iacocca and Fry had predicted, it whipped up interest among the young. But the marketing gurus prevailed they still weren't convinced enough people would be willing to buy a two-seat roadster. Ford's new car would have to have four. The car that emerged barely resembled Phil Clark's dream, but it retained his running horse logo. They also kept the name derived from the P-51 Mustang fighter of World War II. Ford's management wasn't sure that the Mustang would be a hit. Iacocca and Fry had to scrounge to keep the development costs down. One solution, adapt components from existing cars. In our case, we made it out of the Falcon, which is our cheapest, smallest car at the time, inexpensive. And so the, what the Mustang is a reskin, underneath the skin of the Mustang is a Falcon. Iacocca and Fry liked what they'd done, but they had to win over Henry Ford. He asked them if they could sell the car. Iacocca said, yes. Ford replied, you'd better. 
To make sure sales met expectations, Iacocca launched a massive public relations and advertising blitz before the car's introduction. Coming April 17th, the unexpected, the new Ford Mustang. Brilliant new kind of car. A new generation of Fords for the new breed of Americans who want stick shift action and room for four. On the night before the official rollout, Ford bought time on all three major American television networks. Wherever they tuned, people saw the Mustang. His Mustang. Mustang is only days away. This generated over 2,600 newspaper articles the next day and made sure everybody knew about the Mustang. It was officially launched on April 17, 1964, at the New York World's Fair. The car caught on immediately. People all over the country stormed dealerships trying to buy one of the snazzy new cars. A Chicago dealer had to lock his doors to keep his customers and cars from being trampled. It was the same story all over America. Iacocca and Fry didn't have to worry about Henry Ford's warning that the cars better sell. They just had to find a way to build enough of them to satisfy demand. There are worse problems to have. The same kids who once dismissed Ford cars demanded Mustang models for Christmas. Final pit stop. Simulated V8 engine, check. Steering, check. It was a remarkable turnaround, accomplished by just one car. I believe that all that we had in mind was to design the most beautiful car we could within that price range and uh, to make it every bit as desirable by the public as we could. The team wasn't surprised when as many women as men bought Mustangs. When we were asked to do the design work for this car, I was told, make sure, Joe, that the ladies will love it. The affordable car appealed to modern young women who wanted to show that they were capable of having as much excitement in their lives as men. Buyers could choose from an ever-growing list of options and body styles. There was a hard top, a fastback, and a convertible, with or without automatic top. Four engines were available, three clutches, three transmissions, two drive shafts, seven rear ends, and three different wheels, as well as numerous other options. This automotive smorgasbord enticed the average buyer to plunk down about $1,000 on these very profitable options. Iacocca became a legend, but his newfound fame became a liability. He was grabbing the spotlight and Henry Ford was being ignored. This didn't sit well with Ford. He became visibly testy toward Iacocca in meetings. When working for a monarch, it's not a good idea to upstage the king. The intrigue at court didn't hamper Mustang sales. The car continued to set records. Iacocca's reputation continued to grow, and more and more he was seen by outsiders as the star of the company. He found a kindred spirit who also understood how to please the public, racing star Carol Shelby. Shelby was a Texas-born country charmer whose tongue-in-cheek, good-natured embrace of cowboy hats and overalls endeared him to the press and fans who followed this international racing star. But a heart condition forced him out of racing after he won Le Mans in 1959. It was a blow, but he had a plan. Create a limited edition sports car that would challenge Europe's best. 
With Iacocca's help, Shelby created the Cobra, and it became a household word. Iacocca wanted Shelby to work his magic on the Mustang and make it a high-performance car. So I called a friend of mine that, that ran Sport Car Club of America, and I said, what would it take for this thing to build a sport car? He said, but I'll tell you very simply. He said, uh, put a more powerful engine in, put bigger brakes, improve the suspension, take the rear seat out and throw it away. <laughs> so I called Icoca and told him, yeah, I could do it, but I needed $15,000. He said, go ahead, and the Shelby GT350 was born. Some called it the Shelby Mustang, or Shelby GT. The GT350 could be ordered with a staggering array of options that turned these cars into a serious performance. They started to win national championships. Sensing a publicity opportunity, Hertz offered GT350s for rent. Some people rented, raced, and returned the cars with a different engine. They kept the high-performance engines for themselves. This wasn't a great program for Hertz. But Ford got a boost from the notoriety surrounding the GT350's racing exploits. Even though sales numbered just a few thousand. The Mustang wasn't alone for long. General Motors brought out the Pontiac Firebird and the Chevrolet Camaro. While more expensive than Mustangs, GM's powerful V8 engines and smoother ride attracted buyers. In 1968, Ford responded by putting more ponies under the hood. Even the Shelby Mustangs eventually got more horsepower with a new engine, the Cobra Jet V8, as well as a new front end and a new model the GT500. While the GT500 soon outsold the GT350 two to one, very few were built. Recently, collectors have bid up the prices. To give more Mustang fans a taste of that blistering performance, Companies like Unique Performance created updated replicas of the fabled GT350s and 500s. These are authentic Shelby continuation cars. What we do is we find um, good donor 65 through 68 uh, vehicles that need to be rescued. They're cars that are probably going to be uh, rust, uh, rusted out eventually in a field or crushed. We rescue the cars, we sodium wash them, we start with bare metal, put all new metal in the car, and everything is brand new on top of that. While some purists may be put out by the replicas, anyone who drives one fantasizes about being Nicolas Cage in Gone in 60 Seconds. So not only does the car make you look like Nicolas Cage when you're driving it around, but you can go really, really fast, stop well, and go around corners like you're in a slot car. But in 1968, the big news was the fate of Shelby's mentor, Lee Iacocca. He was bypassed when somebody else was named president. Iacocca bided his time. The new head transformed the Mustang into the Mark I and Boss 302s. But sales plummeted, and in 1969, Iacocca was finally named president of the Ford Motor Company. Unfortunately, sales continued to fall in the 1970s. The total performance car appeared to be on the way out. A series of gas shortages combined with an increasing array of government emissions mandates robbed America's muscle cars of their power. Detroit didn't want to build compact cars, but it didn't know how to build fuel-efficient, low-emission performance cars either. Executives hoped people would continue to embrace their cars while they figured out what they were doing. In 1973, 
they transformed the Mustang into a near compact. The Mustang too had the correct long hood and short deck, but everything was much smaller. While it had a certain appeal, it didn't seem right that this charm bracelet sized car should be called a Mustang. It stayed in production for five years and tried to hold on to loyal Mustang fans. Nothing seemed to work. It kept slipping. The Mustang was clearly adrift. Its creator, Lee Iacocca, was cut loose in July of 1978. Henry Ford said he didn't fire Iacocca because the company wasn't making money. He felt Iacocca was too conceited and self-centered. The company's new president reinvigorated the Mustang. By 1979, a revised pony car sent sales soaring. But by 1982, the Mustang was being dragged down by a recession. Sales dropped to 130,000. The entire auto industry was in a slump. Even the debut of a new convertible couldn't generate enough sales to pull the car out of the economic doldrums. By the end of the 80s, Ford talked about sending the Mustang to the glue factory. Horrified by the prospect, Mustang fans rallied and sent thousands of letters to Ford. Executives quickly realized that killing the car was not a good idea. They decided to launch a new Mustang to celebrate its 30th anniversary. The Mustang was back just in time for a blowout birthday bash in April of 1994. Mustang lovers like President Clinton showed up to take part in the event. A lot of nice things have happened to me since I became president. I never dreamed I'd be invited here to this event and given a chance to drive my car. Nobody lets me drive anymore. The new Mustang made diehards happy and seduced new fans. Ford had finally found ways to meet emission guidelines without sacrificing performance. It signaled a new era for American cars. Mustang fanatics know every nut and bolt and every serial number of their cars. They're a loyal bunch who truly love cars. This makes designing a new Mustang a perilous assignment. When Ford's designers set out to develop what would become the 2005 Mustang, they had to make sure that the feelings of the fans were heeded. Some say they are more curators than designers. These high-octane curators created a car that was set to roll out onto the streets in late 2004. Well, as most of you have heard me say many times, if I only had one car to drive for the rest of my life, it would be a Mustang. And I think this Mustang makes me even more sure of saying that. We have delivered when many skeptics wrote us off. Ford is back. The public wouldn't have a chance to try it out until the fall, but it promised to deliver all the power, performance, and style that Mustang loyalists demanded. The Mustang was still going strong after 40 years. It was clearly an American car with all the muscle and excitement that had made Mustang a household word around the world. 